Okay. Um, so, opera. Uh, <laughs> this, so opera, the word means, uh, the, the word opus. The, first of all, excuse me for, I basically can't talk this morning because I've only gotten like three hours of sleep each of the last three nights. Or two nights blah, 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 blah. So, if you, anyone wants to ask questions at any point, that'll probably give me stuff to riff off of. That'd be good. Otherwise, I just have to riff off the computer creativity, like Me Too brought up, which has good things too. But uh, yeah, so anyway, please interrupt as much as you like or not. Uh, so the word opera is the plural of the word opus, which we all know from, you know, Beethoven opus number 131 or whatever. Opus means work in the singular, and opera means work in the plural. So sometimes you see like a opera omnia, which means the, someone's entire body of work. Um, and so this was a concept that I became very interested in by way of that sort of conceptual node there, this idea that this is a sort of, uh, it's, it's formally encapsulates the concept of pluralism in a sense. So opus is plural, is works. Um, so here I have opera as a sort of node of pluralism uh, which connects outwards to all of these different uh, cousin concepts that it brings to mind for me. And so I'm going to go into these a bit, and then I'm going to talk about the opera that I'm working on. Um, uh, so we could start anywhere. Um, <laughs> opera works. Okay, so we... So, okay, so works. Two... <laughs> Um, excuse me, two, two frames for work that I have. One is the work is in labor, right? So you're doing a job. Um, and one, and so there's a word called operaismo, Italian workers' movement, the labor struggles movement, operaism, workerism. Um, that's one link. Ideally, this would all be, I'd, I didn't put together a PowerPoint, you know, but ideally this would be linked to all these different things and teach you about them all. Um, the other meaning of opera is, and this is related, I think, to what Me Too was talking about, um, the other meaning of work, excuse me, is work is a concept in the physical sciences. So, you know, work is part of the sort of cluster of concepts in physics, like energy, force, work, uh, and so on. And, you know, work is, I don't know physics that well, so this is just from reading Wikipedia or whatever, but work is doing, performing a change of energy in some sort. And this word, work, um, was not used in physics until the 19th century. Um, I think it was a guy named Sidney Carnot started using the word work to describe the work that... Uh, coal was able to do to boil water, make steam, make engines move. And so this was the Industrial Revolution, um, and we talk about steam engine doing work. And this is interesting, because around this time, you know, before there were a lot more windmills, like in Holland, and water, water, uh, water wheels and different things. Um, and of course, laborers always working, right? Uh, but <laughs> around this time, Industrial Revolution, uh, steam and coal and fossil fuels, right, with global warming and everything, started doing a lot of the work um, that machinery or, you know, whatever was doing. So machines started doing the work. Basically, the point of this is that labor work and physics work, I think, are very closely intertwined. There's a cool book called... Um, uh, Entropy and the Eco Economic Process by D Nicholas George Skoo Rogan. I don't have that written down, but this talks about this history. is very interesting, talking about economics, uh, thermodynamics, because this is a lot about, so I have this, you know, thermodynamic work, mechanical work, and so on. So, okay, so that's two. We have labor work, operism, which is struggle for works, uh, or struggle for workers' rights, wages for housework, you know, we all gotta do dishes. This was a movement, I think, associated with operism in the 70s, a feminist movement, that everyone is having to do, uh, you know, a lot of emotional labor at home in addition to 
chores, housework, and different things. And so there was the idea, wages for housework. Now that's a connection to something else. Did I write it down? Did I write it down? I don't know. Um, so I'm going to move to a different document here. This is the name of the talk, too. Because labor power is the work that we all do to get money and so on. You know, we convert ourselves into labor power to uh, sell that power to try to get cash, to get food. Um, horsepower is what, uh, you know, people talked about horsepower before watts or whatever. And this is part of the cluster of physics concepts. Uh, power, energy, work, force, potential, all these sorts of things. Horse opera. I'll get to horse opera and dog opera soon enough. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so yeah, I said the wages for housework, and everyone's working on the house, or the the women are all working on the house at least. Uh, and the word that you'll maybe know from uh, from the yogurt company is oikos, which is a Greek word for household, and this is the root word that has become eco in ecology and economy both, and uh, eco plus, plus logi is, uh, logi, logos is like ground or reason or a variety of other things. I don't speak Greek either, so there's also Wikipedia research um, and so on. Uh, nomos, ecology is a more recent concept too. It was originally called economy of nature, another 19th century thing. Uh, people would talk about the economy of nature, like Darwin, you read Darwin, and there's all sorts of economic stuff in there. Malthus, who talked about the you know, geometrical increase of population, uh, was a big inspiration for Darwin. A lot of this ecological stuff was inspired by economics and then applied to, uh, to natural systems. Economy is household management. Uh, nomos is management or rule. And uh, so this, this is all a, a sort of twisty way. This, this, this uh, oikos, eco, ecology, economy, this was my sort of conceptual obsession a couple years ago. I often have, the, right now it's opera, right? A couple years ago it was this oikos thing. And I believed at the time, I maybe still believe, I don't know, but I don't care anymore, that, uh, that games, uh, forms could always be described in one of two ways, as either ecological form or economic form. And economic form, since it's the rule of the household, the management of the household, this would be rules that describe what you can or cannot do. Um, like, you know, I'm in basketball. You're allowed to you have you have to dribble the ball. If you don't dribble the ball, you you get uh, you get a penalty. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's a rule. But what makes it a rule is the fact that you can break it. It's not actually. Uh, it's not real in a sense, it's real because it has real effects, um, but it's really something that could change any time. And this is how the economy works too, right? People say, oh, the economy is a real force because free markets are just like physical potentials, blah, blah, blah. Um, but really they're just rules that describe sort of allocation of resources, of money and different things uh, that could be changed at any point. Ecology, meanwhile, is... Uh, uh, describes the aspects of games that that uh, structure a possibility space that could not be changed except by changing the material configuration of the situation. So, for instance, uh, I mean most most everything. So, in basketball, how much air is in the ball, and the fact that the ball bounces on the ground, the fact that I am very un underrested, you know. So I've kind of out of it or whatever, that's like an ecological thing because my body is like an animal and the animal's made of mud or whatever. Me too, a story that uh, Alan Moore was talking about. Um, so these, so okay, so, so, anyway. Um, uh, ecological form was the form that I was really interested in. It's in, in video games in particular. People have said this before that, uh, you know, video games do not have rules. They only have affordances. And uh, be, you know you code you code and while you're coding it's kind of like their rules at that point because you say oh, okay the player is going to jump this high but I can change that it's going to be this high blah 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 but once it's actually a game it's like it's just like a stone or a sandwich or a basketball or a body um, it's just a thing that has participates in our whole 
cluster of physical concepts, right? Force, potentiality, work, blah, blah, blah. So um, anyway, that was all an aside to describe partly how I got to this idea of opera where I'm at, which integrates the, uh, uh, these, these two sorts of economic and ecological form um, where the, these physical concepts, thermodynamic work, mechanical work, these describe what I would call uh, ecological forms. And then the operism, labor, work as in labor, that's like sort of economic relations. Um, so the, that all plays into this. Um, game theory, okay, so we could go, go off. So I don't know where I'm gonna go now, right? So does anyone have a preference what I talk about next or should I just figure something out? No preference. Um, okay, so opera, uh, dogs. dogs, okay, we're ready for dogs. Okay, let me open Unity for that. Yeah, maybe it's all very dry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, so, okay, so basically, yeah, this, this was all sort of like, so for the last, you know, I made this game Proteus, and it did really well, so I had a lot of money for a bit, and with that, I just like to read books, and sit around, and I just read, basically, and like lived like a prince for a couple of years, just like, just reading and developing like conceptual obsessions and the sorts of like anxieties that those give rise to. Um, but that was fun, but it's no, I, I sort of lost track of, so I had this idea that eco ecological form in games, um, which described what I was really into, but then I got so obsessed with the concept, I kind of forgot what it was that I was into in the first place. Um, so my dogs, okay, right, so we all love dogs, and um, I, after the last project that I was working on, Panoramical, as it was starting to wrap up, I realized I'd been working in Unity to put all the music into it, uh, and, and I was like, Unity looks kind of easy, it kind of, you know, I just have this stack of crap here, I just put it a bunch of different objects in the scene. This is like the ecology of the scene. I was talking to Paolo yesterday, and this is related to, these are all my like employees in the scene, because remember that everything is working, right? So not only we're working, but also the CPU is working, and this is in a sense that no scientist would disagree with, because they're doing physical work, thermodynamic work. This is thermo, you know, your computer, this, the, the game is pretty like intense and decadent, so it makes the power strip get really hot. It could like burn you. So there's like thermodynamic heat work, just like the computer's doing yoga or something. Um, so here are all my workers, um, or in, in, in one scene. So anyway, I got into Unity, and I had been working on it on Panoramical, and I decided it'd be fun to try to play around with uh, making whole the whole game myself or making different games. So part of that, the idea of opera is that I, when I'm making music, I make a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time just making a lot of different things. You know, I'll get up in the morning and I just load up the preset and I say, okay, what am I gonna do? I don't know, I just like stick some crap in. And then the sound is off. Can we turn the sound on please? Um, Oh, maybe I need to tell it something else. Nope, okay. So remember the... <laughs> um, so yeah, sometimes, like, you know, this isn't a very good track, but it's not a bad one either. So sometimes you'd make a track and it just takes 10 seconds, and I'd say, oh, okay, that's a good one. So I'll just, like, save that, and, like, let's call that the dog, too. Um, and I just got all kinds of tracks like that, um, and like, <laughs> what am I saying? Um, here's one. So, so basically with Ableton, I have to deal with music a lot of times. I have a vast sort of, uh, archive of little fragments. So I have the pluralism that, that we've talked about, opera as a plural of works, comes sort of uh, ready-made in my process. I'm fine producing a plurality of materials. Um, but then there's this idea of Unity, right, which is the name of this software, and is also sort of the idea that I think a lot of us think about when we hear the word opera, the Gesamtkunstwerk, Wagner, total artwork, is a unification of all these different things. 
Um, so, so I was exploring that. So anyway, uh, all in a side here, let's bring up a dog. So, here's a, here's a dog um, who's one of my employees. <laughs> and That's all that happens in that one. <laughs> um, that was the first dog scene that I did, I think, and or the first one that I put music into, maybe. Um, so uh, let's cruise around some more dogs. So part of the so so this is what did I call this an opera? Why do I call this an opera? Part of uh, you know, there's been all the concepts that I've talked about. Um, in addition to that, I want to bring back the horse opera because this is a concept that you all hear the concept of like space opera which is like Star Wars or something and the concept of space opera is derived from the concept of horse opera which is like some sort of like kitsch western form where cowboys would like to sing to their horses um, just like in uh, just every once in a while so so horse opera I'm really into this idea that opera is also this uh, is it a cultural universal? Is it actually, because there's not, you know, we also think about opera, is the grand opera the expensive aristocratic opera? Um, but there's all these other uh, non-Western operas. There's the Peking opera, which is really wonderful. Um, there's this Balinese, we well, could call this, they don't call it, they actually call the Peking opera, Peking opera and Cantonese opera and uh, Chinese different opera forms. But we also have different uh, sort of theatrical forms that are grounded in music like this Balinese shadow puppet theater. So there's like, I don't know, basically we hear opera as like a word that we think me means a really specific thing, but I've been understanding it as meaning quite a lot of things, including this horse opera, as, a, as opera is sort of like a, a kitschy concept, horse opera, soap opera, you know, Bollywood movies, Star Wars, and this made me wonder, is opera, instead of actually being like a pretentious form that's difficult for everyone, is it actually the most intuitive form, like the only form that like babies get? Um, Maybe it is. I don't know. I think it is. Uh, and I think that has to do uh, with, uh, I forgot what I was had thought I had to do with. Um, so I'm not going to say. One other wonderful opera, just because as long as I've got, oh, okay. And also, has, has, has anyone watched this R. Kelly, Trap in the Closet? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, wonderful modern opera. Um, that <laughs> I won't play the whole thing, but what's really wonderful, well, here, I'll, I'll Okay, so we'll stop there. I re if you like that, you, you know, there's like 20 or 30 of these or something. And so, so part of what's fascinating to me about this, and I remember watching it a while ago and thinking it was really funny and corny and watching it like a month ago and being just like, thinking it was really like beautiful, um, is, so it uses the same beat every 30, for 30 tracks, same beat, more or less same melody, but the melody's not quite the same. So when there's melodic variation, it's like, whoa, a swoon, you know? Um, and a very beautiful voice too, and just incredible melodies. 
Um, but so this deals with this idea again of our one, our you know, opera as plural of works, and these are the sort of like concepts that I think are at play there. Is you know, one thing, many things, unity, multiplicity. So if I hold this up, I say, how many things are here? How many things? Any guess? One thing. Well, there's maybe one hand or five fingers, or how many things here? Three. I like three. Yeah, three. <laughs> three will do. Um, you know, one fing one finger, but also like a fingernail, and then like a finger bone, and then like some nerve endings, and then a little bit of muscle. And so, basically, these concepts of like one and many are uh, are never fixed, and they're always and even in mathematics, you know, in set theory, you talk about how. <coughs> The number one is created from the set of the voids or the the null set, I believe. Um, so this like s spirals all the way down, you know. Um, and so it's really fascinating, but it's so straightforward because you could ask a kid how many things am I holding up, and they could like trip out on the answer to that too, because um, it's a, it's a horse opera. Everyone gets it. Um, so back from R. Kelly to my dog opera. Um, So that, that was, yeah, that's the idea of opera is this form that is s sort of totalizing in some sense, um, but it's also uh, sort of irreducibly plural in some sense, and the relation between the totality and the plurality is, uh, is not fixed at all. So it's, that's all, the sort of constant tension of it. That's like the dialectic. Uh, we hear that a lot in terms of the you know Marxist dialectic political things, but also that can just be these two concepts that are at play with each other and creating new forms from how they from how they play. Um, so back to my dogs. Uh, um, let's go to the table of contents because. So this I, this I did this recently because I have all these the mess of scenes that I'm trying to put together into a whole. So I have my have my multiplicity trying to create a unity, even though you would think I have unity because it says it up here in the corner. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's horrible. Um, so now I've got a table of contents, right? And I've got my dog. He's still there. Don't worry. Um, and he walks around. Through a nice temple there, nice tree, and uh, so as you hover over these different things, they're not always filled in, but it brings up the plot. So you, when you play the game, I found it was too hard to integrate story and games, so I just tell you the plot in advance, and then <laughs> and then you play it. Um, so here's a Here's a fun one that has some Mozart in it. What, now, why didn't that make any sound? That shouldn't be making sound. Thank you. game, the Oik OS is the operating system that all these dogs use, and I could tell you about the theory of that, which is going to be need to be described in text, not in gameplay. Um, but so here's the Oik OS, which is actually, this one is just a screenshot of my uh, Mac OS, but Oik OS, of course, is a pun for Oikos, which is the yogurt company and, uh, and root of economy and ecology. So I always want to, I play around on my operating systems, and remember operating systems as opera, is an opera ting system, opera ting, and uh, so, so I always like the idea of like an operating system that, uh, that's actually like fun to use, and is like a mess, just like an artist's studio or something, you can paint the walls, you can do whatever, so I have this, you know, these line renders or whatever, the trail renders. In Unity, I hang out here. I have one floating folder that doesn't have anything in it yet, but I can 
climb that. And then of course, of course, we're and of course we're a dog right now still. But I didn't zoom in all the way. But <laughs> small dog. Um, and and of course we're on a desk. So that's all with that one. Um, and oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I've got this is just been like a play playground of a lot of different things. Um, that here's the office where all the dogs work because they're all um, this is, takes place in different historical time periods. I think this one is in uh, like 2050. It's set in the the dogs all work in this shipping container, which is uh, up at the North Pole, where uh, various companies. Well, here's some, let's see how the dogs are. You know, we have a mathematician dog, science. <laughs> yeah, right. Who's figuring out ideas about work, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And we have there we have Diogenes, who is who is friends with a dog. And these dogs who are inspired by Diogenes, they're taking a nap. Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, there. So these dogs are. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. These dogs are fans of Mean Dogs too, and also Babe, Big in the City, which is a wonderful movie. Um, so this is their office, and they're all game developers. And I can tell you how these. Why are they, how are these dogs game developers? Well, um, what happened is in 2040, uh, everyone got fed up and demanded the universal basic income. And so, and then once everyone got that, and what this means, have you people heard about this, the basic income? Right, yeah, so everyone gets money and everyone gets to like make art all day or do housework or whatever kinds of things are fulfilling. And so this sort of like labor force for like, game development dries up, so we need dogs to do all the work. And here they're on the treadmills, powering the containers. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but so, well, I don't know. I don't know, is this interesting? This is kind of like what Mitu was talking about. You have, uh, uh, have stuff and then imagine stories in it. I make all these things and sort of imagine the story and have a blast with that, but maybe it's just like, whatever, who cares? Um, but you know, we've got, they're working on an adaptation of the Zelda Ocarina of Time for Milton Friedman's 80th birthday anniversary or death anniversary because he was a big copyright activist. So these are libertarians, they don't like copyright. Um, so it's a sort of tense situation because some of these things we agree with and some we don't. But, uh, so they've got the Deku tree, they do all kinds of creative modifications of the tree. Uh, blah, 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 it's from other, blah, 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 Ah, okay, let's know what's more. Um, any more t tips for where I should go? Should I keep cruising the dogs, or? Keep, okay. <laughs> well, I'll show you, okay, I, I can't access this one from the table of contents. Um, I, so the very first, I'm gonna pull it up on YouTube too, just so we can see the, what's often called, it's not, it's like the third opera, not the f first Western opera. Um, but uh, it is, it's called Orfeo. It's based on the Orpheus myth. Orpheus is like the, you know, patron mythological character of opera. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna play the very beginning of this because I have like an adaptation of this. So I'm gonna play this and then show you the adaptation in the dogs. This is a really beautiful one too. Huh?
I start using this material, do you remember the tune? So, so I've got a little adaptation of that. I like this idea of adapting uh, works to games because I think that this is something that they do in a lot of other media, and I think that uh, I think that there are cool ways to do this with music potentially that I don't know about with other things. I want you know I think with other forms could be too cool too. People always think, oh yeah, you can't adapt uh, movies to games or books or whatever because they're linear forms and games are possibility spaces. The cool thing about music though is music too is a possibility space. That was my first conceptual obsession, was that music and games are identical. Um, and so that's some old, old hat business. Um, but the cool thing about that is that you can make adaptations of them. So, can we get the volume up a little too? So how this works is uh, I have this text system and I'll, all that, so I haven't done any programming here either. I got Fernando Ramayo, who I made Panoramical with, has made me wonderful tools. So Unity is sort of becoming like Ableton to me. Um, but I'm still able to put together things like this. I have a harp, so if I move, move my mouse up and down, I play the harp. And then I click, and I'm gonna fill this in with different sounds right now that I have right now, but and different texts too. I just have a silver there. So the chord's changing every time. So this is actually the notation here that for the old uh, uh, Orfeo that we just listened to, and this is the melody. Uh, the, and we're right here in the melody, I think. Uh, and then these are the bass notes and then there is implied chords on top of the notes. And the chord of the heart here changes as we move along. Listen carefully. When you got bit by the snake, you died, and we mourned you. It's over a year now, and we all still miss you. Oh, I've hired a team of This is what leads to the table of contents, as I have it right now. Um, so yeah, uh, 
basically, I want to have more fun with that. This idea that you can take, well, and I'll show you one other place where I had some fun. Not an adaptation of existing piece of music, but... So, here's all the levels, right? And there's a secret level! Ooh, look at that, you found a secret level. So basically, there's like all these different ways to like decompose a piece of music and have it uh, turn it, have it available as like a, a game that the player uh, co-authors, right? So here's a notation for some music, and we say. So this is. I would like. To, I show you. Uh, this is a, a project that I did with a friend who's been a friend for a long time, too. Not this, but this idea. That, so I'm kind of musically illiterate a bit. You know, I can read like one uh, melody, but I can't read piano music. I sure can't read like a music theory book. I, I long to be able to, uh, you know, go up to a book of, of music and be able to sort of just like touch the pages so that I know what notes it's talking about so I can understand the theory. Well, okay, there's a simple solution to that. And you just... So this is... happening so for since I'm playing it <laughs> is it not <laughs> so okay um, well yeah okay here, I'll show here I'm gonna open this up so you can see how this works basically there's like colliders on all of the uh, uh, all of the note heads and different uh, musical notations there save changes sure I don't know and because uh, when you're playing it, it makes sense. But I realized that you were watching, so you didn't have the same sort of intimacy with the. So come on now. So you can see all these green. This green stuff is like colliders. Um, and so this was a real pain, speaking of work, right? That the real pain on my wrist. Um, put a bunch of these colliders on all the note heads. There's like a city of colliders, right? And then there's more colliders up here. And so I'll go back in, but so basically, all the music you're hearing was, you know, like, it's like all the, all the notes are like bad guys that I'm crushing or something. And and then there's another side over here. And this doesn't use the same collider idea. This has the the pitch is being bent based on the mouse speed. Um, And then...
course, our notations all the way back down there. I'm meaning to... It goes really slow now. I'm meaning to increase the speed so you can zip on back down. Um, but... That's basically that. I had a lot of fun uh, with this idea that this is a sort of opera. Oh, it's time to end. Okay, well, I'll end. have some lunch. Okay, well, that's the end then. <laughs> uh, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> questions? Well, yeah, I mean, I could open up the panoramical file too, but there's not time for that. But yeah, so there were, yeah, Fernando made a lot of tools for me to use. That's how I got into Unity was, so when I worked on Proteus, I didn't make, touch any code, any tools, anything. I just made audio files and sort of described pseudocode for how to implement them. And, and Ed did all the work on that. And then so with Panoramical, Fernando was like, oh yeah, it's easy to use Unity. And I was like, blah, boo, I don't want to touch that shit. Um, but he made me all these wonderful tools and then I grew accustomed to it. So they'd be tools like, uh, you know, basically I would stick all these, I would make some, uh, loops in Ableton or little events uh, and stick them all into Unity and disc describe, uh, you know, tell them what, what slider would control what parameter of them, often a filter or volume or a simple effect. But sometimes there would be, which I've used in this too, like a, you imagine my four fingers, like if this is a slider, uh, I'd be able to stack sort of a ladder of sounds. So he made a lot of really fun tools and that's for, for panoramical and then different tools for these. Uh, and um, though some of the some of the same ones too, is that a bad answer? What <laughs> I could show you on the computer too afterwards, if, or if now I don't know if uh, yeah right right right. Um, but yeah, definitely got tools, and it was cool using the because the using the panoramical tools was what made me realize like oh yeah, using Unity is kind of like Ableton, so I'm ready as long as I don't have to program anything. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you all for putting up with <laughs> my sleeplessness. <laughs> thank you. Hey guys, now there's one hour of a break and we meet here at 1 p.m. for the micro talks. Thank you.